your feet for the reading of God's Word, and then we'll read. Then you can sit back down, and I will stand for the rest of the time. Romans 3, verse 21 through 26. And by the way, man, I'm just so honored that you are here. Love this. I feel like I have the most important job in the world just because, you know, this is serious business. And you guys come and listen to me, him, haul, and spit and sputter. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, I try to do that as well. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness, listen now, is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. It's not a race thing. Verse 23 is the bad news verse. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory or the glory of God. But verse 24 is good news right behind the bad news. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Could we pray together? Lord, would you strengthen me? Would you put your hand on the next 30 minutes? Father, would you be on my words as simple as they are and be on the hearing ears and the hearts of the people in this room to hear what you're saying to the church. Bring the backslider home, Lord. Bring the person who is lost in darkness into glorious light. Only you can do that. That's your work, Lord Jesus. Father, I just pray that we're all attentive to your word and that your Holy Spirit comes and makes preaching effective. Without the Holy Spirit, it's not good. But with the Holy Spirit, Lord, it's life-changing. So speak to us, Lord, and only as you can. In the mighty name of Jesus, and will forever say, Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, guys, today there's no introduction. I just want to get straight to point one and give you the bad news. The bad news is, number one in your outline, that every one of us is born with a sick soul, a looming death sentence, and a great need of a Savior. There it is. Worst news I can give you. You are born jacked up. You are a messed up human being and you need help. <laughs> As do I. We're all born with this mess, this, this uh, heart that is bent and has a proclivity toward what it wants and toward wickedness, right? And if you don't grab a hold of that, the gospel isn't great news. Like I've heard people say, I believe people are generally good. I think, I think at the core, people are really good. No, they're not. They're at the core wicked and selfish. They're mean. They bully and they gossip and they slander and they talk and they steal. At the core, that's who they are. Psalm 51 says, surely I was sinful at my birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Listen, you didn't have to steal a cookie to get sinful. You were sinful before you came out. And then in Genesis 8, 21, every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Now, moms and dads, look straight at me right here, but you know what I'm talking about. Little Jimmy is not perfect little Jimmy. Little Jimmy is a tyrant sometimes. And little Jimmy will lie straight through his teeth to your face. And you don't have to teach him that. It's in there. Because at birth, we are born with a sick soul. And because we're born with a sick soul, we're in a death spiral. Death and hell is on the way. We can't get out of the death spiral unless somebody rescues us out of it. And that's why the gospel is good news. If we're, if we're inherently good and we're going to make it because we're good enough, then the gospel's okay news. But we're not. We're in trouble. But the gospel says there's a Savior who loved us so much that he came to pull us out of the death spiral. To, relieve, to, to, to rescue us from hell, to give us heaven, that means the gospel is great news. Now, just to show you in living color how bad the human heart is. God, Genesis 1, you with me? First chapter, 
When God finished the first chapter of Genesis 1, even though he didn't say that's the end of chapter 1, when the chapter 1 was over, we ended with God created this beautiful creation, six days of work, seven days Sabbath, but he looked at the sixth day at the end of chapter 1, and he says, you know what? This is good. Thank you for helping me preach. And actually, he said, this is very good. End of chapter 1, we're good. Flip the page one time. Just flip one page over, and this thing's already unraveling on us. No longer are we good. We got problems. We've got sin, and it's bigger than eating an apple. We're killing people. Brother killing brother. One page after God said it's very good. Flip one more page, and we're so bad, God's had it up to here. And he's going to start over. Genesis 6 is the flood, brothers and sisters. Out of the hundreds and hundreds of chapters we have yet to read, we can't even get to Genesis 6 before God says, that's it. I'm starting over. Flood. Drown everybody and everything except for Noah and his righteous family. They get out alive. Everybody else is done. Six chapters. Now, as I read that, let's see if you're like me at all. I'm thinking, let me tell you this. When Noah comes out of that ark, they're going to live straight. I mean, if anybody has learned a lesson about the wrath of God, Noah knows what's up. Anybody think that with me? I mean, you know better though, right? But we know it ain't too many chapters later. Noah's getting drunk. (laughs) Noah, the, the ark builder, the one who was righteous enough to be saved from the flood, drunk as a coot. And we can't get out of the first book of the Bible, out of 66. By the time we get to the end of the first book, there's lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, men want to have homosexual sex with angels, a man having sex with his daughter-in-law, human trafficking, all in Genesis. We're not even to Exodus, brothers and sisters, and we are jacked up. We are born with a sick soul, a looming death sentence. We need help. I've said it before. I'll say it a thousand more times if I live. If we are left to our own devices, we will destroy our lives. We will break the hearts of people who depend and love us. We will wreck our lives in a mess. Number one is the bad news. Hey, it's going to get better. Breathe. Breathe. It's going to get better. But number one is the problem. We're all sick We all have a death sentence waiting us, and we all need a Savior. Now, who's ready for good news? Say, let's go. Number two, Jesus offers justification. And justification means a declaration of righteousness. Justification, I I thank God that verse 24 comes right right behind 23. 23 was, you've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of you. Verse 24 says, but all of you can be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Justified, declared righteous, declared innocent. How many are justified? Say amen. amen. How many are not sure what justified means, but you're still glad you are? Say amen. So here's what justification means. Justified is in the Greek a legal term, and it means acquittal. It means declared innocent. Charges dropped. Uh, record expunged. You are clean. You're innocent. No longer a death sentence. No longer a prison sentence waiting on you. You are declared innocent of all charges thrown at you. Even though you did it. Even though you're guilty of all these things. Justification says, wipe the slate clean. I remember it no more. Nothing's hanging over your head. You're innocent. That's a good moment, brothers and sisters, and it's a miracle of instantaneous grace. Now, a lot of people, you've heard this so much, it's like, bah, bah, bah. it's like religious jargon in one ear, out the other, I'm justified. Let me put it in these terms. I read about a man in, named Kevin Strickland. In 1979, he, he's a black man. In 1979, Kevin Strickland, black man, was wrongly convicted by an all-white jury in Missouri for a triple homicide that he didn't commit. There was no physical evidence linking him to the scene. Family members gave him alibi after alibi. He was with them. 
And the whole testimony, the whole case was built on the testimony of one woman who was a supposed eyewitness. And he was convicted to prison. I think of a 50 year sentence plus something else, or 50 years without parole, and then something else. Anyway, even though the woman who had the testimony tried to come back repeatedly and recant her testimony, saying, The police coerced me to say that. And he was staying in jail, they wouldn't hear her out. Until 2021, November of 2021, 43 years of a prison sentence for something he didn't commit. November 2021, finally a judge hears his case, realizes it's absolutely bogus, and acquits Kevin Strickland and says, we're sorry, you are declared innocent once and for all, you are free to go. Which in me, rises, anger rises up about the injustice of the moment, right? We want to go punch somebody out because that should have never happened. But I'm trying to hone in on the moment this man who had been thought guilty for 43 years, this man who had had the guilty sentence on him for 43 years, this man who thought he was going to spend the rest of his life in jail, that man, when he heard innocent of all charges, free to go, the moment of emotion and joy and relief, that is justification. And brothers and sisters, no matter how wicked we've been, no matter how much Genesis looks like our life, no matter how much adultery, homosexuality, cheating, lying, stealing, of all that happens in our life, when we come to Christ, we trust in him and he justifies us. He declares that we're innocent of all charges. He doesn't remember them anymore. Everybody say, I'm listening. He doesn't have a file on you. Oh, hallelujah. He doesn't remember anything in your past. He wipes it away and has cleansed you from all unrighteousness according to his grace. That is justification. But it's better than that. I've heard uh, justification described. It's just as if I never sinned. Has anybody heard that? That's how to understand just, just as if I never sinned. Yes, but that's not enough. It doesn't go deep enough. Justification is not only declaring you're innocent, it's declaring you're the righteousness of Christ. That changes everything. No longer am I innocent and getting away with something. I'm now wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus himself. I am now, oh, his record is my record. Even though I'm guilty of X, Y, Z and, and Roman numeral 1-3B, I'm guilty of all of it. When I believe on Christ and he justifies me, his perfect record becomes my record. And when God looks at me, he doesn't look at all of my file. He looks at his son Jesus, whom bought me with his blood and gave me his righteousness. I'm not a second-rate citizen in heaven. I'm somebody who looks like Jesus. Because he gave me his righteousness. Thought y'all might be a little more excited about that. You understand you're not only forgiven, you have the standing of Jesus himself in the kingdom. Not as the authority, not as Lord, but as the righteous standing. You belong, you're cleansed, you're, cl you're clothed in who he is. Here's the difference. If I'm declared innocent, I look like Adam before the fall. Holy but not tested. But if I'm justified, I'm not Adam before the fall. If I'm justified, not just innocent, if I'm declared righteous, I am like Christ even after the fall. His righteousness covers us. That's justification. Anybody want to thank God for justification? Say amen. amen. Number, number three, he offers regeneration. Now, if justification changes my, uh, uh, my, my standing, regeneration changes my identity. It changes who I am on the inside. Regeneration is, a, uh, is new life being born. Regeneration is taking something that was dead, boom, springing it to life. Has no chance without regeneration. Titus 3.5 says it's with his mercy by the washing of regeneration. That's how he, he renews us and gives us the Holy Spirit. The word regeneration means an absolutely new life. Now, you can't get excited about that until you realize how dead you were and how dead I was. Ephesians 2, as for you, you were once dead in your trespasses and sins. 
Colossians 2.13 backs it up and says, and you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, comma. Don't read past the comma yet. There's people who's living on this side of the comma, dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of their flesh. Now, I can't express, express it any more than dead. Dead isn't sick. Dead is dead. You're, you're hopelessly sick. You're, you're dead. It's over. Call the funeral home. Put you in the ground. You're done. That's dead. But regeneration promises he can take that which is dead and give it life. Not improve the deadness. Not wiggle your toe and give you a little bit of life so you can wiggle your... No, 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 no. That which is dead as a hammer dead can have the life of God, boom, pick it up, and all of a sudden, a living new soul is born. Amen. That's what happens at regeneration. And may I tell you, Christianity and regeneration isn't improving who you were. Right. This is just... It's in my crawl here lately, and I'm just going to keep on saying it until it gets out. Christianity does not improve you. It's not here to make you a better citizen or a better husband or a better wife or a loving mama or a loving dad. Those things happen just because God's nature is put in us. But Christianity is not about you being better. Christianity is about you being absolutely made new. Christianity is about you coming to the cross, laying down who you are, and God raises you up to be who he meant for you to be. And that can only happen through regeneration. It's, it's bringing something dead to life. It's getting, it's getting the Holy Ghost paddles and putting it on your dead soul, and poof, he picks you up and you're alive in Christ with a moment of explosive anointing. But it makes you new. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature, Everything in the past is gone. All things have become new. That's a miracle. That means you go home and it's you, but it's not you anymore. Because God has changed you. It looks like you, but she gets a new husband. Because when you come to Christ, he made you new. Oh, hallelujah. I'm glad this isn't a, an improved version of Chad. An improved version of Chad still stinks, to be honest with you. But I'm new in Christ. It's, it's like the Apostle Paul when Saul was walking on the road to Damascus. Remember this? Why was he going to Damascus? Somebody help me preach. Why was he on his way to Damascus? <laughs> Say it louder. He, persecute or kill Christians. He is on his way to drop the hammer on some churches in Damascus. Why? Because that's what he did. That's who he was. You see, Saul hated Jesus, hated the Christian movement hated the churches. He lived to shut it down. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he had papers from the high priest to do more of that when he got to Damascus. All that to say, he wasn't going to a men's retreat to come back a better man. He wasn't going to a, a, a little uh, a sabbatical to think about what he's been doing and come back improved. Nope. He is on his way as dastardly and as sinister as he ever was to kill and persecute Jesus people. In other words, he's as far opposed to God as you can be. If you think you have a hopeless loved one that doesn't want anything to do with Jesus, no worse than Saul, no way, no how. Saul was the epitome of anti-Jesus. Take hope, brothers and sisters. Because in one moment, light from heaven came, put Saul on his backside, blinded him. Then Jesus spoke out of nowhere from heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul said, who are you? He said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. By the time Saul got back up on his feet, he was no longer the old Saul. He was the new Saul. How do we know? Because everything after that moment changed. The church he was once trying to persecute, now he becomes the apostle of the New Testament church. The Jesus he hated is the Jesus he's serving and preaching and will die for one day. Everything changed. Saul was regenerated. It looked like the same Saul, but it wasn't the same Saul. A new creation in Christ. And I'm going to pause right here long enough to say, if you've been in church long enough to do the jargon and the lingo and your life hasn't changed radically, 
then I'm going to invite you back to faith in the cross one more time because once you're regenerated, there's no going back to what you were. You are a new man, a new woman that knows him in power and in strength. He gives you the ability to live holy in a godless world. Regeneration. Somebody say regeneration. regeneration. New birth. That's what it is. All right. Well, if he saves me by justification and regeneration, even though I was born with a sick soul and a death sentence, it, 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 just in case somebody's in the room, you say, I want some of that. I want that. Number four. Well, here's how it comes about. The offer of salvation is received by all who repent of their sins and believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Now, that's, the, that's, that's our response to the Holy Spirit's conviction. Okay? In other words, we aren't saved by osmosis. That's not going to get you saved. Okay? Nor is coming to church every week going to get you saved. Now, it can occur, and possibly the more frequently you're in an environment like this, the Holy Spirit might work on your heart, but the coming to the church is not what saves you. So you don't evolve into being a Christian. No, it's a moment in the presence of the Lord where, bam, life comes. Old you dies, new you rises up. And, it, it's, and it's not random. If, if you want this, you repent. Acts 20, verse 21. Paul de declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in the Lord Jesus. In the epistle of Peter, he said, The Lord is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. No repentance, perish. No perish, it's because you repented. It's, it's the key. But it doesn't randomly fall on you. Salvation doesn't come just random. It doesn't, and God doesn't back you in a corner and say, you're going to be saved. No, it, he offers the free gift of salvation. And to receive that, we repent. Now, let me love you just a little bit. Repentance is not confession. There's a lot of confession that doesn't have repentance accompanying it. <laughs> confession is, yeah, I did it. And you can tell by that tone and that, that, you know, that attitude. They ain't repenting for nothing. Yeah, I did it, so what? Don't hate the game. Hey, don't hate the player, hate the game. You know, I did it, I'll do it again. That is confession, but there's no repentance. There's no remorse. Repentance is when you come to a place. Oh, here's the Greek for repentance. A reversal. A shift, a change in direction, a 180, turnabout. Now listen, I've heard good, good intention people give their testimony. I met Jesus and I did a 360. Yeah. And I know they meant well, but I said, I hope not. Because if you did a 360, you're going in the same direction you were before you met him. Which, by the way, as a pastor, we see a lot in the altar. They'll come and they'll confess. They'll come and get it off their chest, but they don't do a 180. They do a 360, run right back to what they were confessing. And there comes a point in the life of someone that really wants the life of Christ in them that repentance must overwhelm them. Repentance isn't a one-time deal. Repentance is embracing a life that abhors sin that is broken and sorrowful for any sin they commit and chooses a life that walks away from it. That's repentance. And the fact that we've got people week in and week out, week in and week out from 2008 all the way to this year still confessing the same sin shows a breakdown in the system. And it's not on the side of the Lord or the cross. It comes down to are we truly repentant people? He comes to the repentant, not those who are in confessional. Some of you will have to think on that one a minute. Paul said, those we, are we must repent and believe. And then we come to the part of belief. If we're going to receive this, not only do we repent of our sins, but we believe. Believe on what? Believe that what Jesus did was enough. 
Listen, we can't, we can't make what Jesus did any better. Our salvation is based on what he did. Belief on the cross, belief on what Jesus did for us. It's enough. And that's a stumbling block, isn't it? If you're like me, I kind of want to barter. I kind of feel like I had skin in the game. Nobody's like me. I kind of want to feel like I earned it a little bit. You know, I did so. I proved myself. Hey, I'm in it. I'm not like those other yahoos. I, I, I did this, so he saved me. I'm the only one. Anyway, so I think there's a part of it that wants us to say, well, I, I did this, so that's why he did this. And if we're not careful to keep the cross, the message of the cross in front of us weekly, we, we drift toward a, a religion of faith and works. Yeah, I know Jesus did it for me, but I got to do this. Yeah, I know this saved me right here, but I'm going to do this so that my salvation is secure. What? What he did is enough. We're like some of these people on the screen here that, from other religions that feel like they have to harm themselves and self-flagellation to show their commitment to their God. One is a, a specific sect at the Catholic Church laying down there before the shrine and Top left is the Shia Muslims. Top right is a Hindu lady who goes through extreme body piercings. And they hang weights from those piercings and do a journey so they can pay homage and worship their God. What are they doing? They're thinking they have to do something to please God. They have to do something in order to earn his, his, uh, his love and his acceptance. And we look at that and we go like, that, how ridiculous, that's stupid. Okay, we'll take them off the screen. Isn't it just as ridiculous to think that our Bible reading earns our salvation? That our Hail Marys, that our penance, that our church attendance earns our way into salvation? Sure, well, yeah, we're not slapping our back, but back until we bleed, but we're still trusting in our works instead of his work to save us. And Paul said, it's none of that. It's repentance of your sins and belief on Jesus and what he did was enough. And then, poof, he shocks your dead soul to life with the life of God and he declares you're innocent and the righteousness of God. You're no longer guilty so that now you're out of the death spiral because a savior rescued you. Well, that's the salvation message with a lot of hand motions. That's salvation. How does he do this? What's the power behind the message? Number five, if this happens, it's because there is a power in the blood of Jesus. Number five, there is power found in the blood of Jesus. That's the only way the justification, regeneration promise happens. And the blood of Jesus isn't a, a very, uh, you don't hear it a lot. Kind of like you don't hear repent a lot. But, you know, blood is just so gory. Can't we clean it up a little bit? Clean what up? The cross? The, the Golgotha? You, you think you can clean that up? You, you want to clean it up so it's easier to look at? Are you serious right now? Let me help you. If you watch The Passion of the Christ or any other movie depicting Jesus on the cross, they, they grossly under-depicted it. Grossly. The Bible says he was marred beyond recognition. It's not that you were going to walk by the cross and say, hey, that's Jesus of Nazareth. You wouldn't have recognized him. He was beaten to a pulp and so bloody and abused, he was beyond recognition. The point is, Sin has a price tag, and somebody had to pay it. The wages of sin is death. And we're not getting out of it and getting to heaven without somebody dying. Tracking? That price has to be paid. And then further, Hebrews 9.22 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So not only does somebody have to die, somebody's got to bleed. Well, we're not getting out of this. We're still in the vortex. We're still hell bound, brothers and sisters. If somebody doesn't bleed and somebody doesn't pay the price for sin, because if God were to, if God were to sweep sin, sweep sin under the rug, then he's, he's, he's denying that he's just. And God is just as much just as he is love. So this has to be satisfied. Something has to bleed. 
That's why the very first sin, we turn that one page and we already got a problem. Adam and Eve try to sow Gucci leaves together and cover their sin. And God has to come on the scene and say, that's not, a, that's not good enough. One, because you covered it yourself, it's a work of hands. And two, because there was no bloodshed. So God provided animal skins, animals bled so that sin could be covered. Well, lucky for us, somebody did die and pay that price and somebody did bleed. They plucked his beard out and he bled from his face. They smacked him and they beat him with their fist and he bled out of, out of the gashes in his face. They slammed the crown of thorns on his head. And these are, these are violent horns and thorns and blood came down. Then they whipped him across his back 39 times, ripping flesh like ribbons off of his bones. Blood poured out on the whipping post. They nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. They pierced his side. And this blood flowed to the earth so that we could actually have this moment where we repent and believe. And that blood just wasn't the blood of a man. It was the blood of the Lamb of God that takes away our sins. So that no longer do we have to earn our salvation or be good enough. Our salvation is in what we do. It's in what he's done. He bled, he died so that our sin could be, could be paid for and atoned for. And that's the only way out of the vortex. No other religion, no other self-improvement courses. If you're getting out of the sin, sick, soul, death spiral, it's because we look on the cross and the one on the cross paid the price so that we could be set free. There was a day of atonement, a holy day. The band can come up. The day of atonement was a holy day for the, on the Jewish calendar, right? And on this one day of year, the, the high priest would go into the holy of holies, sprinkle blood, and have to do it by the letter so that the sins of the people could be atoned for. You heard of this day, day of atonement, holy of holies, some of you? There are two key players. I know there's a lot of movement right here, but... You, you really need this. This is a good story. This is real talk. There are two goats that has to be in play in for the Day of Atonement. Two identical goats. And they cast lots, which is Bible talk for drawing straws, about which goat was going to do what. One of them is going to have his throat slit, blood's going to gush out, and that blood is going to be applied in the Holy of Holies. The other one is going to have the sins of the people transferred on him by the laying on of the high priest's hands, and he's going to escape, so-called, into the wilderness of Azazel, which is where we get the term scapegoat. So after the straws were drawn, lots were cast, this one is going to die, and it's going to be sacrificed to the Lord. <laughs> Blood, altar, messy. That blood of the goat is taken into the Holy of Holies. It's sprinkled just the way it was supposed to be. As they did that, they tied a scarlet thread around his two horns. This guy over here is going to be the scapegoat. The high priest is transferring the sins on, of the people on the goat, and they tie a scarlet thread around his throat. And they take him out in the wilderness. He was supposed to escape, but they actually ended up throwing him over a cliff so he would die. You say, why would they do that? Because nobody wants their sins coming back into camp after you're supposed to be forgiven of them. Come on, somebody. So they kicked that joker over the cliff so he wouldn't come back. And there was a third scarlet thread that was tied to the temple doors. And because the people couldn't go in the Holy of Holies and watch that, and the people couldn't go out in the wilderness and watch that, they watched the scarlet thread. Because the Jewish historians say, that when that animal's blood was put in the mercy seat and that animal went over the cliff, miraculously the scarlet thread on the temple door turned white. Signifying that God had accepted their sacrifice and their sins for another year were forgiven and atoned for. Isaiah 1.18, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. They'll be red like crimson, they shall be as white as snow. Every year they watched the scarlet thread on the door and it turned white until Jesus died on a cross. Every year after the crucifixion of Jesus, the scarlet thread on the door stopped turning white. Why? 
because the blood of bulls and goats are no longer sufficient. The religious of the Old Testament no longer was needed. A better covenant and a better promise and a better high priest has come. And the Lamb of God, the eternal Lamb of God, bled. And that is the only blood that can satisfy now. No longer are our religious deeds going to do it. No longer is the rote and the ritual of religion going to do it. It must be the blood of the Lamb that was shed for us. That is what gives us atonement and forgiveness and cleansing of sin. What, what nothing else will do. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. No religion, no good deeds. It's Jesus and His blood. That's why we get out of the death spiral and heaven's our home I was listening to Alistair Begg a a sermon and just he's got a Scottish accent so he's fun to listen to just because of that but he's a pretty pretty sharp dude and uh, he closed out one of his sermons talking about the thief on the cross you may have heard this or seen it going around on Facebook or something but um, bottom line is how did that dude get into heaven how did the thief get there? Because, you know, they both started off, both of them hanging beside Jesus, and both of them are making fun of Jesus, cussing him out or whatever. And finally, the, the thief who made it into heaven had a moment. I feel like the Holy Spirit opened his eyes, and he's like, what, why are we making fun of him? We're guilty. He's innocent. And, and I believe he opened his eyes to who Jesus really was because he said, hey, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom, which, which means I believe you're a king. If you've got a kingdom, I believe you're the king. He had a moment of faith right here, right? So anyway, so everybody dies, right? Now picture the moment the thief comes into heaven. And I'm not saying this is the way it goes, but it's just the way tradition, you know, St. Peter's at the gate making sure you're, you're supposed to get in. Or whoever, whoever you want to be at the gate, I don't care. And then you say, hey, dude, uh, what's your name? Uh, so we don't know his name. Uh, thief on the cross. Okay. Uh, and you're here how? Oh, no. Do you understand the doctrine of justification by faith? The, the doctrine of what? You mean you don't understand it's by faith alone we're saved? Do you not know the five solas? Uh, what? How did you get in here? Were you baptized in water? Uh, no, never had a chance. Didn't know I was supposed to be baptized in water. Then how did you get in here? Um, the guy on the middle cross told me I could come. That's all you need. The guy on the middle cross told me I could come. I didn't go through the religious ritual. I didn't go through water baptism. I didn't go through a membership class. I didn't have time to give tithes or do any of that. And although those are, those are things Christians do, I don't get into heaven because of Christian things we do. I get into heaven because of what Christ has done. And the guy on the middle cross said, I'm good enough. So we get in. How many's getting in because of the guy on the middle cross? Amen. Would you stand on your feet, everybody? Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you for the miracle of grace, for pulling us out of a death spiral, giving us justification and declaring us the innocence and the righteousness of Christ, giving us new life, turning us out of a dead soul into a living spirit that knows you. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. That's how we're getting into heaven. So in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray you seal this moment up by the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen your church meet someone in the altar who needs to pray and i will give you all the glory for it in the mighty name of jesus amen Uh, a few members of the altar team if you can come to the sides please that would be great just need a few over there Uh, altar team members thank you here's what we're gonna do we're gonna close with this song and we'll worship together but uh if you need to pray about anything altars are wide open if you possibly feel in your heart you need to give your life to Christ listen if you feel that way it's not because of me talking that's the Holy Spirit you can't come to Christ without the Holy Spirit it's the Holy Spirit quickening your heart you feel the paddles on your heart is what it is this is your moment so what do you do repent and believe so if you want to come down to the sides we have a free Bible for you marked up prayed over we'd love to pray with you and celebrate with new life in Christ Everybody else, if you don't need to pray, let's worship before we go. 
Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope that the message was a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. If it was, we'd just like to take a few more seconds of your time and ask you to do a few things. First of all, if you don't mind, there's a digital connection card that you could submit and, and, and send our way, and it'll let us stay connected to you more personally. First, it'll let, you, let us know who you are. Second, how frequent, frequently you tune in. And also, there's a place for prayer requests, and we would love to partner with you and pray about what's going on in your life. The second thing that would be great is if you could just take a moment, click a link, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay connected with what's going on at The Point every week. And also, man, if this was a blessing to you today, it might be an encouragement and a blessing to somebody in your friend group or in your network of influence. So why don't you just share this video and pray that God uses it to encourage them as well. Finally, if uh, you'd like to consider blessing this ministry financially, there's a giving link at the bottom. You can click down there and that'll help us continue to throw out videos like this that could be a life changer for somebody out there. So guys, thank you again for joining us. We're so blessed that you did. We're so honored to have you as a part of our online family. And we want you to know one more thing. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you next time.